Next up, we have Eliza uh, Barnwell. She's a fourth year medical student from MUSC in Charleston. So she's from Charleston and then did her undergrad at Virginia. And she's going to talk to us about pediatrics. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the title of my talk today is Developing a Model for Postoperative Axial Length in Children Undergoing Bilateral Cataract Surgery to Optimize Visual Outcomes. Uh, this is a project that I worked on with Dr. Ed Wilson and Dr. Rupal Trevetti at the Stormy Institute. So just a little background, pediatric cataracts are the largest cause of preventable, preventable blindness in childhood. There are numerous etiolo etiologies. They can be present at birth or form later during childhood. The estimated prevalence ranges from about 1 to 15 per 10,000 children. And like in adults, cataract removal with IOL implantation is found to be safe and effective in children beyond infancy. And so we take biometry measurements of axial length and keratometry preoperatively. And this is very straightforward in adults, but complicated in children because their eyes are still growing. So the axial length hasn't yet reached um, its final measurement. So what we know about axial growth is that it increases dramatically in the first 18 months of life and then proceeds to grow slowly until around age 18 to 20. Uh, newborns have a mean axial length of 16 to 18 millimeters. Adults have a mean axial length somewhere between 22 to 25. Um, the final axial length is difficult to predict and continued growth after cataract surgery can be influenced by many different factors. So it's hard to know um, which IOL to implant. So when you're implanting an IOL in children, the goal is to restore normal vision as the eye develops into its adult size. So most pediatric ophthalmologists um, account for the refractive shift over time by leaving the child hyperoptic right after um, surgery. There have been a lot of tables developed to guide <coughs> surgeons in uh, post-operative post refractive goals, and here are just some examples. And as you can see, they're not all the same. So one of the issues is that there's not a lot of consensus in the literature on ideal post-op goals, and there's a lot of variability in post-op refraction in kids. So if the eye proceeds to grow more or less than expected after surgery, refractive errors can develop and can lead to poor visual outcomes. So if we could better predict how the eye will grow in an individual patient, we could potentially develop a better IOL calculation method. So the aim of this study was to develop a model to predict future axial length of individual patients undergoing pediatric cataract surgery. We wanted to focus on children undergoing surgery after 18 months of age, just during the slower phase of growth. I thought this would just be an easier time to predict growth. And then we wanted to use the model to make more accurate IOL power calculations. So this was a retrospective chart review. Pediatric patients who underwent bilateral cataract surgery at the Storm Eye Institute. We included um, children who had surgery at greater than 18 months of age with at least two consecutive AL measurements. So one baseline AL at surgery and then at least one follow-up axial length. And the exclusion criteria were traumatic cataracts and octopia lentis syndrome. The data was collected in a REDCAP database, which is a secure online database, collected demographic information of gender and race, collected cause of cataract, type of cataract, whether or not there's family history, baseline measurements including age, AL, technique of AL measurement, ACD, lens thickness, keratometry and visual acuity, and then follow-up measurements of age, AL, technique of AL measurement, ACD, K, and visual acuity, also the IOL type and location, and whether or not there was glaucoma. And this study was uh, MUSC was kind of well a good place for the study because we tend to uh, get data on axial length at each follow-up appointment. So there was a lot of um, data for that. And um, for the statistics, it was done in SAS. We first did univariate associations um, using GEE models, which is a generalized estimating equation. 
and this approach is an extension of linear regression that's really useful in ophthalmic studies because it accounts for the correlation of the left eye and right eye in the same patient and also the correlation of um, um, repeated visits with the same patient. And then the univariate models were used to develop a final multivariable model for predicting postoperative axial length. So here are just some of the patient characteristics that we had. We had 100 total participants, or 200 eyes. 58% were male, 42% female. 58% were Caucasian, 35% were African American, and 7% other. The mean baseline age was 6.8 years, and the mean final visit age was 12.7 years. The mean baseline axial length was 22.4 and the mean final axial length was 23.3. The median number of follow-up visits uh, was two, with a range from one to 13 visits, and the total follow-up time was about six years. And this is just um, a scatter plot of all of the axial length measurements and age points, and you can see it kind of follows a linear trend. And so this is the results from the univariate analysis. So the univariate analysis was looking at um, individual variables and the effect on axial length. And the ones highlighted in yellow are statistically significant. The green too, I just highlighted race and gender in green because I thought these were kind of the most interesting to interpret. So this is saying that males on average have an axial length that is 0.97 millimeters longer than females, and uh, Caucasians have a mean axial length that is 0.95 millimeters shorter than other races, the other races. Uh, so what we did is we took the univariate results and all variables with a univariate p-value less than 0.2 were considered in the multivariable model. So the variables that were considered were age, race, gender, axial length, baseline axial length, type of cataract, whether or not they had glaucoma, and the age of follow-up. So in the final model, these are the variables that were found to be statistically significant. So baseline, axial length, age of baseline, age of follow-up, and the interaction between baseline age and age of follow-up. And uh, what's kind of interesting is that uh, race and gender were not statistically significant in the multivariable model, and we think this is the case because we think that uh, by including the baseline AL and the baseline age, we're accounting for those differences in gender and um, ethnicity. And it's really easier to make sense of this written if it's written as a linear equation. So this is kind of the um, prediction model written out as an equation. And I just came up with some hypothetical examples just to show you how this equation would work. So if we have um, patient one, the light blue line, it, this is a patient, say at 2.5 years, has a baseline axial length of 20.5, and then we find the predicted axial length at age 18 to be 23.1 millimeters. And um, you can see the other two patients have different ages and different baselines, and they have different final axial lengths at the same um, uh, final age. So kind of the usefulness of this equation is that it can be used in a IOL calculation, um, IOL calculator, instead of our current method, which is that most pediatric ophthalmologists enter the preoperative AL and K into an IL power calculation formula, and then they adjust the power based on the age of the patient to account for the myopic shift, so kind of like <coughs> the table I showed at the beginning. But um, an alternative method could be to use this model to predict the future axial length of the patient, and then enter that, in, and then enter that predicted axial length into the IOL power um, formula. And we think this could potentially be a more accurate and customized method of IOL calculation in children. And um, just one thing to note, the keratometry is less, 
support is the less important part because it doesn't change that much after one year of age. You kind of reach your uh, adult keratometry around one. So that was not as important as predicting the final axial length. Um, so some of the limitations of the study was a, was a retrospective chart review, so a lot of factors couldn't be controlled. Um, the follow-up time for patients and time between visits were variable, and also not all of the patients were followed into adulthood. So only 13 had final measurements taken greater at 18 years of age. So it, and, and it would also be useful to know the refractive error of the child's parents because there's definitely a genetic component to myopia. So and, and axial length, so that would also be useful information. I think the strengths of the study are just, um, one of the main strengths is the amount of data we've collected on axial length over time. Um, MUSC has really done a good job of um, making sure to record the axial length at follow-up visits, and um, that data is very useful. This is uh, the first study to attempt to predict individual post-operative axial length in order to improve idle power calculations. So just some future directions. We want to pr prospectively test this model um, by comparing the predicted AL measurements to actual AL measurements in patients following cataract surgery. And uh, we also, if any other institutions have um, data on axial length, we could validate the model that way. And uh, it would also be nice to um, go back to our data set and look at the patients um, who are now old, um, at the adult age just to have more complete knowledge of the axial length once they reach adulthood. Okay, so that's it. Are there any questions? Yes? Very nice presentation. Um, I don't know if anybody's looked at this, but just out of curiosity, have there been any studies where they've actually gone back and looked at how many of these children go on to have lens exchanges and or refractive surgery down the road later on in life? due to an incorrect power population? Um, that's a good question. I think that's something we could maybe look at in our data set. We haven't done that yet. That's, um, Dr. Ed Wilson has done that extensively with, kind of within the infant aphakia treatment trial, mm -hmm. but also on his own. Scott Lambert's published a lot on that too. And, um, while the general trend for those tables that Eliza nicely put up is that most people don't require a lens exchange, we have these outliers, mm -hmm. these patients mm -hmm. that, you know, they'll be minus 20. And they started the same way that the other patients did. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is why there's this need for in a more individualized formula for children. But I liked your point, too, about knowing the parent's refraction. And I think one strength of this study was to consider bilateral mm -hmm. cases. Because in a unilateral situation, you get inappropriate axial growth from, like, deprivation or amblyopia. So mm -hmm. this is more representative of the typical course that would, the child would have. So that's really interesting. So why, with those outliers, like the minus 20, why do they speculate? I mean, would they have been a minus 20 anyway, or was it somehow impacted? Um, do they have any idea? Well, uh, in some cases, there is increased axial length um, outside of a normal adult range. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in other cases, it might be within um, so that's most of the cases, and so there's, it's just unclear why that is or how we could have known that initially to better power the IOL. But then in some cases, um, you'll still see axial links within the appropriate range, um, but because they started with a very short axial length, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, we just were not able to predict appropriately what power to put in. And you'll see, I mean, we do have challenges too um, you know, I'm doing a two-year-old today, a unilateral case, and I'm going to make one eye plus five, yeah. you know, because I'm trying to prevent myopia when he's older. 
but then he's so anisometropic in the short term. So yeah. if we could limit that in the short term, if possible, that would be helpful too. Just curious how they measured AL there. Is it all optical or immersion every time the kids came in they went? Uh, so the, it, this was immersion in some of the older kids was ILL master. Okay. So these kids were all coming back for EUAs and then having immersion done again? Uh, some of, yeah, some of them were not under anesthesia. So. It's cooperative kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do immersion in the Yes. And after keratonomy, does your study actually look at that, or do you just sort of say it didn't change? Yes. Much? Some studies have actually shown there is a fair amount of change. We did. Look. the first 18 months, three or four doctors. So yes. We looked at it. And we did look at it. We, we um, in this study, since we were looking at kids older than 18 months of age, um, it was kind of, it, there was no significant change. But we did collect it. Thank you.